Hey Pattern Pals, get ready for a treat because today we have Robin, our expert pattern maker here, and she's going to help us debunk five common fitting myths. And I think this is going to really change the game for your sewing. So this is a special video podcast episode of Seamark Radio, where we share practical ideas for building a creative process so you can sew with intention and joy. And if you're interested in hearing more from Seamark Radio, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever podcasting platform that you enjoy listening to podcasts on. But today we have some common fitting myths to dispel. All right, so today we have Robin here, our professional pattern maker, who's been with us at Seamwork for about seven years now. Yeah, seven years. Hi, everyone. Prior to that, Robin worked in the ready-to-wear apparel industry, and she's worked with companies such as Patagonia, Ugg, and Hannah Anderson. And today she's here to bust five common fitting myths. Ready to bust some myths, Robin? Oh, I'm um, busting myths. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read the myths and then you can bust them. I'm excited to start busting. All right, let's go. So myth number one is having your own sloper means that you will never have to make a muslin. <laughs> so this is not true. A sloper is it's good for learning basic pattern drafting and understanding how the fabric goes from... 2D flat to around a 3D body. However, a sloper is very specific to that body. It's very close fitting. As soon as you start adding ease and cutting in style lines, moving the shoulder, adding details, you change everything about the sloper that made it fit the body so perfectly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the balance can get altered and that's how it sits on you front to back. You could develop wrinkles somewhere because the pieces aren't fitting together right. Or maybe you went from the sloper to a princess seam and you didn't get the exact, you didn't rotate the dart enough. Mm -hmm. So while it's really good for understanding the concepts and the principles, as soon as you, you change the design, you lose all the information that you had with the sloper and have to redo all that. Yeah. I think a lot of people think that if they have a sloper that's fitted to their body, that's the end of fitting. And, you know, they can just either compare patterns to that sloper or make changes to the sloper. But it sounds like what you're saying is you will still need to go through all that fitting process. Absolutely. You still need to go through the twalling. Things about the sloper will still change. Mm -hmm. For instance, crotch depth on the sloper, because it's very fitted to your body, is going to be very close. Mm -hmm. But if you are creating, say, a wide leg pant from that, things have to change. Yeah. You know, you need to add more ease in the thigh and maybe you're adding a waistband. So all of these things change and you still have to go through the process of testing it and creating a new toal. Otherwise, we would, I mean, we would be able to just knock out patterns because we could just <laughs> start there and, and have it in one, in one go. But no, we, we, Average three pro three prototypes. Sometimes it goes more, mm -hmm. sometimes less, more rarely, but yeah. it's still it's still work. Yeah. Because yeah. you're adding in all these variables. Right. When you're adding all those details to it or changing the ease or whatever you're doing to it. Yeah, I'd love it if we could get that all right on the first try, but all these different things converging at once, you have no more constants. Mm -hmm. So then when is a sloper helpful for somebody? It's good for Understanding the pattern making concepts. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a good exercise to go through. Mm -hmm. It might be good for knowing your shoulder slope and comparing that to patterns, although that can change as well based on the design. It could be good for knowing your torso height mm -hmm. or your sleeve length leg length. It is also very similar. I know a lot of people use sloper and block interchangeably, but they really aren't. The sloper is that thing that's very fitted to your body. Mm -hmm. A block is used more like something like a t-shirt. A, mm -hmm. a company creates a lot of t-shirts and they want to make sure they're not exactly the same, but very close to the same every time. You know, mm -hmm. maybe the width is always the same or they always want the armhole depth to be the same. Mm -hmm. So they would use a block. Mm -hmm. So a sloper, you could create, say, a block from that if you're going to do a lot of the same kind of thing. So block is more of like a specific style that you want to do over and over again. Variations. This is the word Vari I'm looking yes. for variations on that. Variations style. up. Sometimes they have some style lines cut in, but 
But most of the main things are going to stay the same. And so it's easy to move from one to the next. So if you were somebody that wanted to make a lot of pants Mm -hmm. and you created a pair of pants from your sloper, that could become your block where you could move, you could add leg width to it or decrease leg width. But you know that, say, the crotch depth is exactly where you want it. Yeah, very interesting. All right, let's bust myth number two. This is one that I've seen, which is that the block for indie pattern company is is always based on the owner's body or some person who works there's body. Yes, I've heard that a lot too. Mm-hmm. And while that may be true for some small companies, one person companies, it's never been true for Coletta Seamwork, mm-hmm. as you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've used live models since the beginning. Some companies do use dress forms and just dress forms, but in general, there's usually a fit model because you can't, you just can't get all the information that you need if you're fitting it on yourself or if you're fitting it on a form. You need to be, you need to get some distance between you and that mm-hmm. so that you can see what's going on and you can manipulate the fabric. And I'm sure everybody knows when you make your own twalls, it's sometimes it's hard to look behind you and yeah. see what's going on and know exactly what to pinch. Yeah. That would be very difficult to do. For me personally, in this company, it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. I have scoliosis. I, I, you know, that, that's not something that I want to impose on everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> if I were making patterns only for people who had scoliosis, maybe. but They would work great for me because I do too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I have, there are definitely quirks to my body that do not match any kind of average. And I think that's true for most people but we still want to get as close to the average as, as we can. Yeah. We're looking, and since you spoke up about average, that's actually almost its own myth too, mm-hmm. is that we draft for the average person. Yeah. There is no average person. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> we try to draft for the middle of our size range. Mm-hmm. On both size ranges and then grade up and down from there. So if a person's body doesn't match that, Mm -hmm. there is absolutely nothing wrong with that because there there is no average. Yeah. I think that's something that's a little bit hard to get your head around sometimes is that just because maybe statistically this is in the middle, that doesn't mean that there's any one person who's going to be exactly like that, right? Exactly. Yes. We're going from the zero, zero to the 18. So we're just looking for the middle of that range so that when we grade out, lines don't get wonky. Mm -hmm. It stays true to what we're, we're wanting it to do on the base size. Yeah. Great one. All right. So myth number three is that if a person has to make adjustments then there must be a drafting error. There must be something wrong with the pattern. Great. This is a this is a really good one. So unless a person's body mm-hmm. is exactly the same as the model that we're fitting on, mm-hmm. they will have to make adjustments. Yeah. And it is extremely unlikely. I have seen it a couple times where people say, oh, I don't have to do anything. And that's mm-hmm. fantastic. They, I'd like to use them as a fit model. <laughs> But for the most, for most of us, we have to make changes. Mm -hmm. We have to make height changes in the four zones of height, Mm -hmm. not just chopping it off the bottom. There need to be height changes in all those different areas on your body. There are width changes. Rarely does anyone fall exactly in a size. Mm -hmm. Our shoulders are often different. Our arm lengths, our biceps. So it is absolutely normal to have to make three, four, five. I make six changes to a pattern because I have a lot of heights that are off and places I need to grade between things. Mm. It's completely normal. Yeah. And it depends on the style of the pattern too, don't you think? Like how many adjustments you may need to make. Absolutely. Something that's more fitted, like the Emma dress, mm-hmm. is probably going to need more tweaking. But it happens with simpler garments too. Regular tank tops, things that look really easy can be surprisingly challenging if you don't know exactly what you need to do for your body or how your body different differs from our fit model. Yeah. I think that's, that's almost a separate myth is that just because something is simple doesn't mean that it's going to be easy to fit. Yes. It's actually a joke between us when we're developing the ones that look simple, we often have more work on than the ones that look really complex. Yeah. I know for me, I I can look at a pattern and kind of see whether I'm going to need to make a lot of adjustments or a few adjustments. I mentioned before that I have scoliosis, so I have kind of a short torso. So something like the Emma dress, for example, I'm going to want to make sure that it's hitting in the right spots because it's so fitted. Yes. We see this a lot with the upper arm area, the armhole area. Mm -hmm. If that is too long on somebody and that bust is not sitting where it's supposed to, it can look like other things in the pattern are off. Mm -hmm. So it's, 
it's really important to address all the different areas to get things in the right place. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that takes, that takes a few adjustments. Yeah. That's a simple adjustment people can do is that length adjustment to make sure that everything is hitting right where you need it to hit. Absolutely. And sometimes that's the most important ones. Yeah. You know, because you can't see what's going on circumference wise mm -hmm. if the circumference is in the wrong spot on that's your body. That's true. Yeah. That's a really good point. All right. Myth number four is that if your clothing has wrinkles, that means you have a bad fit. Let's think about that. Let's let's unpack that. When you wear clothing, you need to move in that clothing. You mm -hmm. need to have that ease. And more fabric creates more opportunity for wrinkles. So yes, sometimes it is pointing to a fitting problem. Often. But a lot of times it's not. There are hollows in our body. There are hollows where our legs meet our hips. There are hollows up on our upper chest area. And you can't, unless it's meant to be skin tight, dance costume, gymnastic costume, you're going to have some extra fabric that needs to move. Then it also depends on the design lines. Mm -hmm. So if you have a drop shoulder, there's no armhole, right? There's going to be fabric there because it's the armhole seam that takes out that excess, excess fabric. Mm -hmm. So if that seam isn't there, you're going to have fabrics there, which is creating wrinkles. Yeah. I, it seems like um, when clothes have more ease, there's always some amount of wrinkling. Exactly. Least, you know what you're saying about gymnastic clothing. <laughs> like it has to be absolutely skin tight and the fabric has to have stretch. <laughs> right. In order for it to not have any wrinkles whatsoever. Right. A great example of why sometimes you're going to have wrinkles you can't do anything with would be sleeves. Okay. Mm -hmm. So imagine the sleeves on a t-shirt. They, the t-shirt got its name because it, if you lay it flat, it looks like a T, mm -hmm. right? So that sleeve has a very short cap sleeve cap, if any. So what that does is when you put your arm down, you're going to have some excess fabric and the, the, it's going to have some wrinkles, some diagonal wrinkles there on your arm. Mm -hmm. But that excess fabric and those wrinkles, that short cap allows you to reach for things with the rest of your garment not pulling up. Now, the opposite of that is if your sleeve fits perfectly mm -hmm. flat, straight down, no wrinkles on the sleeve. It might look beautiful, but you're not going to be able to move your arm as much as if you have some extra fabric there yeah. that allows you to have lift. What about in, in pants? Because I feel like that's an area where people get really hung up about wrinkles. Yes, absolutely. Again, we have curves. Mm -hmm. And there are areas where we can take wrinkles out. Mm -hmm. But one common place we see them is around the crotch. Mm -hmm. And this is actually, we have hollows there. So this is actually so common that jeans companies embellish those wrinkles, mm -hmm. right? You've seen pants, jeans with bleached wrinkles there mm -hmm. to really let us know that this is normal and this is something that happens. If you have curves and you have hollows, the fabric can't be plastered to your body unless you're in your bike shorts. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How do you, I don't know if there's a clear answer to this, but how do you know the difference between wrinkles that are there because something isn't fitting you correctly and wrinkles that are there just because of the style of the garment or to allow for movement? You go to school for four years and then study for 20. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, you know, it really depends on the style of the garment. Mm -hmm. If something is closer fitting, you and say in a woven fabric, you mm -hmm. like jeans, trousers, Trousers especially, because yeah. there's a little bit of ease, but not too much ease. So <laughs> as that fabric is going around your curves, there are going to be places that it's moving differently. It's a wrinkle that means you have to change something. I mean, I feel like the sewing industry in general does a really good job of saying when you see these wrinkles, these are some of the changes you need to make. But it can be, it can be hard to know. You have to kind of really look at the style and see how it fits around your body. And I, when I make twalls, I always pinch, pinch the extra fabric on my body. Is it going to make it look better? Is it going to make it hard to sit down? Mm -hmm. Things like that, that can help clue you in. Yeah, sort of balancing what it looks like and the functionality and figuring out where that is for you. Absolutely. If you try to take out wrinkles on the backs of your arms, right, mm -hmm. and then try to, try to drive a car, mm -hmm. you'll know. So if you pin that out, and then try to drive and you can't mm -hmm. or hug a person, not everybody drives, yeah. hold your bicycle handles, mm -hmm. <laughs> then you know you need that fabric and maybe those wrinkles are okay mm -hmm. because we're not judging each other. Yeah. I never I never look at people's wrinkles as I walk down the street. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, and myth number five, if the base pattern is drafted for, let's say, uh, a sewing C cup, that means that it'll be a C cup in all the other sizes too. Yes, so this is a very prevalent myth in the industry. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure where the idea of sewing cup came from, but it is ubiquitous across the industry that the difference between your full bust and your high bust is your sewing cup size. Mm -hmm. So we actually draft for actual real bra cup sizes. And the reason this is, is the, the high bust measurement does not encompass all the information about the rest of the body, mm -hmm. right? Especially when you're comparing it to your full bust. It doesn't tell you how muscular the back is. Mm -hmm. It's also how it's measured is problematic because it's a diagonal measurement. So that measuring tape, you could put it parallel there. Mm -hmm. Most people put it diagonal. Mm -hmm. So you could measure it in two different places and get two different measurements. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be too far off, but they would be slightly different. By a diagonal, you mean that it could be lower in the back and higher in the front. Exactly. So how do you do that with and be completely accurate? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, it's even hard sometimes to get that parallel measurement, especially mm -hmm. when you're doing your measurements yourself. But that's not even the most problematic thing about sewing cup size. <laughs> the circumference of the body, full bust, mm -hmm. grows at a greater rate than your shoulders. Right. Shoulders are mostly bone and they do not grow as fast as the rest of it or at the same rate. So your shoulder grade is a smaller grade between sizes. We, all, we talked about in the last episode how the circumference of, say, an eight mm -hmm. is between a six and an eight is one inch, mm -hmm. right? That's your full bust. But the shoulder is only growing a half an inch mm -hmm. from side to side. So what happens with high bust is that it has a grade in between those two. In order to get the armhole as it grades out to be the same shape, as the base size, it can't grow as much as the bust grows. Right. It has to be between those two measurements. Mm -hmm. The only way a sewing cup, that three inch difference on the example size C, could be the same for all sizes would be if the high bust was grading at the same rate as the full bust. Mm -hmm. So just to, just to kind of put it into different words, the high bust, which if people listening aren't familiar with that is, it's kind of under the armpits, right? Mm -hmm. That area that measurement is going to be closer to, say, your shoulder exactly. than it is to your full bust, uh, which tends to grow more as sizes get larger. Exactly. And that's actually how we want it. Mm -hmm. Because if you're using that high bust measurement to get a more accurate shoulder fit, mm -hmm. you want it to be grading much closer to your shoulder than to your full bust. Mm -hmm. People seem to think, from the myth we're busting, people seem to think that um, if a, for example, a pattern is created in a size eight with that measurement being say a C cup, then it'll be exactly the same in all the other sizes. And you're saying that's not true because the grading is different. Because the grading is different. Mm -hmm. So that three inch difference mm -hmm. as you grade up to the larger sizes is going to be greater than three inches. Mm -hmm. So technically the sewing cup would not be a C anymore. It would blend into a D or a double D. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go down as you go to the smaller sizes because the bust is grading an inch around, but the high bust is only grading about five eighths around. So would you recommend when people are choosing a pattern size to go by the full bust measurement and then make adjustments elsewhere, like to the shoulder area? That's how I like to do it. Mm -hmm. But also I, I recognize that I'm at an advantage because I can do it on my on my computer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and because I've made a lot of sleeve changes. And that's that's the where it gets a little bit more complex. I do like to grade between the shoulder and the busts mm -hmm. if they're different sizes. A lot of times I'll choose based on the shoulder. And we do have patterns like the ret jacket and any of our unisex patterns, the bud shacket, where we list shoulder measurements. Mm -hmm. we're, we're doing it more often now. We've got a body measurement that we base things off of and, an, and what the final garment shoulder measurements are. Mm -hmm. So if one is able to check that mm -hmm. and start with that on, say, a jacket or something, or they know they have narrow shoulders, mm -hmm. I do like to grade between the two. 
but then you do have to make adjustments to the sleeve. And typically that's just measuring the cap, making sure that it matches yeah, or has a little bit of ease in if you're easing it in. And if a pattern doesn't have the shoulder measurement listed, um, you can just measure the actual pattern piece, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Once you have that pattern in front of you, mark off the seam allowance and measure between those shoulders. Put that on your body and see if that's what you like. Mm -hmm. And again, it's relevant to design too, design lines. You know, is it a drop shoulder? Is it right on the point? Is it a little bit off? It it changes with every design. So that's definitely something for people to be aware of, that that cup size might not be what you think it is yeah. just based on the, the draft of the that base pattern. Yeah. And you can measure their high bust on the garment, on the pattern too, mm -hmm. just as easily as the shoulder. Yeah. And sort of check that against you mm -hmm. and see how that works. Yeah. And see how much ease is, is mm -hmm. left there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a big proponent of, of using the lines that the pattern maker gives you at any company and, and grading between those because you really can see as well. You know, you can draw a beautiful line mm -hmm. rather than just guessing. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So that was our five pattern making or fitting myths busted by our pro pattern maker here. <laughs> so I'm going to recap the myths for you all. Number one was that having your own sloper means you don't have to make a muslin. Robin, you busted that one. That the block for indie companies is based on the owner's body or somebody who works there. <laughs> if a person has to make adjustments to a pattern, that means there must be a drafting error with the pattern. If your clothes have any wrinkles, that means that you have a bad fit. And if the base pattern is drafted for a sewing C cup, It'll be a C cup in all sizes. So those are the myths that we busted today. And I just want to give a quick shout out to Robin for joining us today. I am so happy that you were able to come here and share your expertise with our community. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. This was so much fun. If you've heard any other fitting rumors that you'd like us to bust, then comment and let us know. Maybe we can make another one. And if you want to practice getting a good fit on patterns, be sure to check out Seamwork. When you join, you get access to our entire catalog of over 200 modern sewing patterns, from quick and easy tops to wear anywhere dresses to tailored blazers and pants. We help you to design and craft your own wardrobe. Membership also gets you access to Design Your Wardrobe, our popular course that walks you through a process for laying out a seasonal wardrobe that you can sew. Plus, membership includes our library of dozens of sew along classes. And best of all, access to our private sewing community, including tens of thousands of members, where you can post projects, ask questions, and even find sewing friends near you. I hang out there all the time along with Haley and the rest of the team here at Seamwork, and I'd love for you to join me. YouTube subscribers get half off a Seamwork membership, making it an incredibly good deal. To sign up, just click the button on screen or the link in the description below to claim your offer. I hope you loved this video, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one.